Hello, I'm Margaret Carol Bergman, Executive Director of Thoreau Farm. I'm here at the birth house of Henry David Thoreau and I'm in the birth room. Our guests today, we have two guests today for the Right Connection at Thoreau Farm in partnership with the Thoreau Society. Um, the Right Connection is a uh, program of workshops, uh, publishing and writing and author talks and seminars. And one of our two guests are um, filmmaker Ivy Mirapol, whose uh, most recent work is Gully Coward Victim, an HBO documentary on Roy Cohn, and previously heir to the execution about her grandparents, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Mirapol is also director for CNN's Death Row Stories and National Geographic's Year of Living Dangerously. And Ivy, I don't know if you remember this, but you're also a contributor to What Would Henry Do? I certainly do remember, Margaret. And if any, anyone who's out there who read my essay knows that I, that I, that was where I made a very public promise to myself and all the readers that I would make a film about Roy Cohn. <laughs> we feel very honored. And also with us today is Ivy's father, Michael Maripol, who is the older son of the Rosenbergs. Michael was 10 and his brother Robert was six years old when their parents were executed in 1953 as atomic spies. Eventually, the boys were adopted by Anne and Abel Mirapol. Michael is the author of We Are Your Sons, a book which he wrote with his brother, The Rosenberg Letters, and Surrender, How the Clinton Administration Completed the Reagan Revolution. He is a retired professor of economics from New England, Western New England University, where he's also served as department chair. So welcome, Ivy and Michael. Thank Pleased you. Pleased to be here. Thank you. Great to be here. So the right connection here at the Rope Farm is an opportunity to share uh, how to bring st uh, stories to audiences uh, through the creative process. So Ivy, if you could talk about your uh, process and your filmmaking in general, uh, but in particular, your documentaries, Heir to an Execution and Bully Coward Victim, the story of Roy Cohn. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so thank you again for having us. I, um, well, I'd say my bringing stories, uh, well, so the two that you mentioned, the two works, I, I made Heir to an Execution. It premiered in 2004 at the Sundance Film Festival. And that was my first uh, documentary. Um, and then I fell in love with the medium and have continued to work in that field for, since then. But I really was compelled at that time to make that film because I want, I want personally to understand more about who my grandparents were as, as real people, not just the kind of mythic figures that they had become to so many in this country, but also to myself. Um, you know, I was grappling with the idea that they were so considered so evil to some, and but yet heroic, innocent martyrs to others. And and I knew there was some somewhere in there that they're real human beings, and that's what I wanted to understand. So I think um, that kind of, that drives all of my filmmaking work uh, in a sense. And it might be surprising to some to to hear that that I wanted to do the same for Roy Cohn for very different reasons, of course. I think it's important to try to humanize someone even that we might, or I certainly have considered evil um, for my whole life and with good reason, um, just to understand you know, how, how he became who he was in some ways and also the, the, the context of the times that helped, that enabled him to become uh, as powerful as he was. So I think, um, that's kind of the short answer to what, you know, what, what motivates me often. I mean, I, I, and I, and I like to bring in all varied voices and I try also when I set out to make a film, I am working against my own preconceived notions. I am trying to work against, you know, um, the fact that I grew up just thinking of Roy Cohn as pure evil. I, you know, I made a film about a nuclear power plant. I wanted to understand, you know, the people who worked inside the plant when I had already kind of allied myself over time with you know, activists wanting to shut down the plan, I wanted to un really understand the other side. So if that helps explain. <laughs> um, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up something from our past. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> the 1999 issue of Provincetown Arts. I was the publisher and Ivy was the fiction editor and Norman Mailer was our cover subject. And 
Ivy had a piece in here about uh, her, her grandparents being painted um, most notably by Picasso. And in that you, you sort of write about how through art, um, you were able to see uh, your grandparents as, um, as saints and angels rather than sinners. And, mm. and actually that article really humanized them um, for me. It was the first time I didn't think of them as, you know, people who sold, you know, nuclear weapon spot, you know, information to the Soviets. And it, it was a very powerful piece and I'm glad that you wrote it. Um, so you and I both knew Norman Mailer in Provincetown yes. in the 1990s and 2000s. And I think that Norman encouraged you to write about your grandparents. Um, he did, he did. Tell me about that, like how did that come about? You know, that was really interesting actually. I, so I, I'm, I wrote that piece for you guys at Provincetown Arts. Um, and that, I can trace that to almost the beginning of my, of making Erdogan Execution actually, because uh, when I set out to make that documentary, I at first thought, well, I'll just interview all these artists and writers who've, who've talked about my grandparents and my family and, and that will be the core of the film. And then I had a realization along the way that that, that, was, that was relying on other people's interpretations and avoiding the very difficult questions that I actually do end up confronting um, in a more personal way in, in the film that I ended up making. But for me, it was because I, just like what you're saying, the, it, it helped you humanize them. I, reading E.L. Doctor's Book of Daniel, looking at artwork, seeing Angels in America even, like all of these, all of these uh, artistic treatments of our family story were what humanized them for me too. And I, I found a way to connect with them more emotionally than I did, you know, just at home because, you know, my dad was busy grappling with the legal and, you know, the political side of, of our story. And the personal was often was something that we didn't really talk about as much also because I would, what didn't want to bring up things that would upset my dad um, too much. Um, and I think I protected him from a young age. I protect, I felt that I needed to protect him from a young age, which is kind of an unusual situation to be in as a young person, but I, but I, I did feel that way. So anyway, I was working at the blacksmith shop in Truro um, on the Cape as a waitress. Uh, when I had I'd worked in Washington DC for years as a legislative aide and speech writer, but then I kind of started over again and wanted to be a writer and wanted to do creative work. And as many people wind up doing, you wait tables. And I was drawn to the Cape, my family, my dad and my parents had bought a house there recently. And I said, can I go live there in the winter? And just, I was writing. That's how I got to know everyone at Provincetown Arts also, because I was an aspiring journalist and writer and writing screenplays. And Norman Mailer was um, a customer at oh. the blacksmith shop. And he had seen the piece that, that you published in Provincetown Arts and put, put it together that I was the one who wrote it. And he said he admired it. And I was, you know, of course, you know, Norman Mailer tells you that it's, it's thrilling. He invited me to a party at his house. He and Norris invited me to a party there. And I, you know, I went and he kind of cornered me there and, <laughs> and said, you know, so they were guilty, weren't they? Just like out of the blue, you know, there I am. He just pulls up to me and so they were guilty, weren't they? And I said, you know, I'm actually surprised that someone like you would say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> were you really? <laughs> Yeah, well, I was because I just thought, I mean, maybe I was being naive. I thought he would have a little more nuanced view, you know, and I said, you know, what do you mean by guilty? You know, like, and then we got, we got into it a little bit and he said, you know, you have a lot to say about this. You have a, you know, your voice, you know, you're a good writer. You're the, and he really encouraged me just to, however it came. I mean, he wasn't telling me to make a documentary film at that point. Cause I thought I'd be a writer, but there is a lot of writing involved in a way, you know, you're editing a film like this. It's, um, it is like writing um, structure, structure wise, but regardless, telling stories, he, he was very supportive. And I thought, and, you know, um, incidentally, you know, similarly, as I did start the process and I reached out when I thought I was going to rely on writers and um, artists to tell the story um, of the film I was making, I, E.L. Doctorow similarly wrote, I wrote to him saying, I'd love to interview you. And he wrote me back saying, this is your story. You don't want to, you don't need to hear what I have to say about my novel, which is fiction. 
I want to know what you have to say. <laughs> How exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have a question for your dad and we're going to talk. Uh, some people have come in a little late. So we're going to um, talk with the mirror polls for about 20 minutes and then we're going to open this up for questions. I'm trying to get this done. Really, we're really um, hoping to involve the audience in this and please submit your questions in the chat section. So Michael, um, can you talk about interactions that you've had with Roy Cohn? I, I know that you vacationed out on the Outer Cape and you and your wife, um, Annie, had purchased a house in Truro. Did you ever like encounter him on the street or walking around town? No, my interaction with Roy Cohn was twice. Uh, once on um, a um, what was supposed to be a pilot for a Barry Farber uh, TV talk show where um, he and I and Barry Farber were there and we went at it hammer and tongs probably for over an hour. And uh, then the second one was the one that you see in Ivy's film, a clip of, namely a discussion with the uh, French language cable show from New York City, which probably was seen by a handful of people. They had broadcast a six hour French dramatization of my parents' case. Um, I assume with, with subtitles. And then afterwards, uh, my lawyer, Marshall Pearl and I and Cohn and uh, uh, somebody from the staff engaged in a wide ranging discussion. I don't really remember how long it lasted, but it was probably in the order of an hour as well. Those were the only two times I was physically in the presence of Roy Cohn. And I have to say, um, it's, this may sound counterintuitive, I enjoyed myself immensely because I was basically looking him in the eye, pointing my finger at him, calling him a liar and a criminal and saying over and over again, you know what you did, you know what you did. And, uh, you know, he did his best because he's a smart lawyer. But uh, after the hour and a half show was over, Barry Farber leaned over to me and he said, Roy knew he was in a fight and it made me feel good because the whole effort that my brother and I began in 1974 to reopen our parents' case, which we did very intensely for a good four years, we felt we were putting the government's feet to the fire and exposing their criminal behavior towards our family. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what Cohn did when, when you say you know what he- what Well, you I mean, he suborned the perjury of uh, uh, the main prosecution witness, David Greenglass. We know this because David Greenglass himself admitted it on 60 Minutes in 2001 or 2002. Um, initially, when my parents were arrested, uh, there was no evidence against my mother except you know, one sentence by uh, Ruth Greenglass who said that my mother was present when my father recruited her husband to be a spy. Um, and as late as January of 1951, which was months and months after she was arrested, there was no evidence against her. In fact, David Greenglass himself had told the grand jury that uh, he never even spoke to my mother about his espionage activities. So they didn't have much evidence against her and a, a congressional committee actually had people admitting that. But one of the prosecutors said, the case against her is weak, but it's really important she be convicted and given a stiff sentence. And so all of a sudden, out of the blue, Ruth Greenglass suddenly remembers that my mother typed up all the spy stuff. And Roy Cohn goes to David Greenglass and says, David, Ruth just came up with some new evidence. Uh, you can either agree with her or you can call her a liar. And David Greenglass changed his testimony, agreed with her. And at the trial, both of them testified that Ethel did the typing. And the prosecutor on summation said she went to the keyboard and struck the keys blow upon blow against her country and in the interest of the Soviets. And that's why she was convicted. And that was the justification ultimately for Judge Kaufman giving the death sentence. It was suborned perjury by Roy Cohn. And that wasn't the only perjury he suborned, but that was the one that, sorry to say, be blunt, blunt about it, that was the one that killed my mother. So you asked President Obama to pardon your mother. Uh, um, exonerate. Exonerate, okay. Yeah, sorry. pardon means well, guilt. Okay, uh, to exonerate your mother, um, but he did not. 
I'm, he didn't even respond to our request. We have no idea if he even saw it. So I'm guessing you didn't ask President Trump. or did <laughs> No, no. We didn't ask President Trump, but if uh, I assure you, if, if Trump loses, uh, we'll be we'll be knocking on the door again. So Ivy, I want to get back to Norman Mailer, but I don't want to make this all about sure. Norman Mailer. Oh yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you would appreciate that, I'm yeah. sure. Um, but um, Norman and Roy Cohn had a connection, as well as um, the co-producer of Bully Coward Victim, Peter yeah. Mantlo. Yeah. And, um, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about this connection. Sure. Um, so Peter Manso, who uh, you see in the film and who was quite valuable to me um, when I set out to make this film, I, I, I met up with him early on and learned that he had saved tapes from a major interview he'd conducted with Cohn um, in 1983 for Playboy magazine. It was one of those, the big interviews that Playboy used to do, big serious interviews. And, and um, you know, I was looking for just that very kind of material that at tapes where Cohn is taught, is speaking, you know, in a casual way and, and you really hear his voice and he could, you know, I could use something like that to help, you know, him narrate his own story. And this was just an amazing find that, that, that Manso had these materials in addition to what we discovered of those unpaid bills and the um, uh, the evidence of money laundering through his uh, boyfriend Peter Fraser, and by the way, that those materials Manso discovered by going through the garbage at <laughs> Cohn's, <laughs> which probably at the Manso Cohn um, mailer <laughs> home in Provincetown, because what so what happened? So eighty three to back up in nineteen eighty three. That's when they first meet. They do these series of, of interviews that are recorded. They become friends. Manso may not like that, that I would characterize it that way, but they were friends for quite a while. Um, and then Manso, Mailer uh, met Cone through Manso. The three of them ended up buying property together in Provincetown and the big brick house in the uh, West End that, uh, or East End that, um, that Mailer lived in for so long. Um, Cone lived in, uh, Manso shared that house with Mailer, with their families. And then there was a garage with an apartment built over it um, where Cone, that's where Cone lived and had. So there was, uh, there was a lot of, I mean, I could, there's a lot of stories around that and we were gonna devote some significant time to that in the film, but we decided it was too, you know, too far afield from the main stories that we wanted to cover. So. Um, they were friends for quite a while, and then um, and then Manso and Mailer got into a famous fight. Manso, in the meantime, at that time, was writing a biography of Mailer. So, of course, you can imagine that that got pretty complicated. <laughs> it was, and uh, two pugnacious fellows um, ended up getting into it and getting in a big fight. I think it turned into a fist fight. And as soon as that happened, Manso and Mailer dropped Manso like a hot potato. So did Cone. So Cohn and, and Manso never spoke again after that either. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, Michael, um, Roy Cohn, he made a, a whole career out of, um, you know, of snipping out Russian spies and um, his case, prosecuting the case against your parents. What do you think he would say, and Ivy, you can jump into um, about President Trump who, was his um, protege uh, being so friendly with the Russians? This would have been an interesting situation for Roy Cohn to experience given his lifelong antipathy. On the other hand, you know, Putin is a Russian, you know, nationalist. He's not a communist at all. And so it is conceivable that he might have done the same flip flop that the entire Republican Party has done. Namely, you know, Russia is, you know, a country we should be friendly with. You know, China's the main enemy anyway. Uh, in fact, I remember a quote from Barry Goldwater way, way back in like the 1960s saying, you know, the next big fight will be with China and Russia will be on our side. And this was when Russia was still the Soviet Union. So it is certainly conceivable that uh, Cohn would have followed Trump with that flip flop. Whereas I actually have wondered a lot when I was making the film, especially um, that, you know, that I thought that Cone 
potentially would be really horrified by what his mentee has been up to because I had the sense from what, what I learned about Cohn that yes, he's an anti-communist for certain, but, but specifically uh, anti-Russia. I think he felt, I mean, I don't know, dad, if you disagree with me, but I, it, it seems as though Cohn had a particular um, fear of and hatred for Russia and felt that Russia was, was our enemy through and through, no matter what their political system. You, you, might, you absolutely might be right. I mean, there's no, no certainties, obviously. Yeah, so it, it, it is interesting to contemplate like what, you know, what he would think of his. But the other his part of this is, let's remember one of the things you point out in the film is that it was Trump, as soon as he learned that Cohn had AIDS, who dropped him like a hot potato. Yeah. And Cohn is the kind of guy who um, bears grudges. If he had survived AIDS and uh, been able to succeed, he would have stayed very loyal to Ronald Reagan, who he respected tremendously. But he might have decided that Trump was beyond the pale for, mm -hmm. for, for disloyalty, for personal disloyalty. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Now, uh, we do have time for questions, so I'm urging people to submit your questions in the, um, the text them to chat and we'll read them as they come in. Um, but in the meantime, um, you point out, Ivy, in your documentary that Cohn had many close ties to media and he was an expert at, um, at manipulating the media. Yes. And I guess, you, do you think he taught this to Trump? Um, and it seems that Trump has the same ability to uh, get the news stories to follow his cycle um, by, by different things that he does. And, um, and if he weren't a media personality on The Apprentice, do you think he would have been president? Or is it, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think he learned some, some of this from Cohn. Um, and yeah, I absolutely, believe that if he hadn't have been on The Apprentice, I can't, I can't imagine because it, it was, you know, he'd, he'd, he had kind of faded from public view and he was kind of considered a joke, at least those of us who live in New York and New York City, um, when I was living in New York City at that time, but he was not taken seriously, Trump. And I guess it's kind of funny to say that he's then taken seriously for being on a reality show, but apparently some people thought that was <laughs> proof positive that he's a successful businessman. And not a not a total joke, but um, where I do think they differ, though, is that, I mean, Cohn was much much better at at working with the media because he befriended them and he didn't attack them. You know, Cohn, I mean, the what what Trump has done is, I mean, he's just he's made the media his enemy, and to me, Cohn Cohn was much more slippery. Yeah, you know, much, uh, much more effective um, in that sense. I mean, it was totally different times, of course, um, and much more, you know, congenial, at least on the surface, you know, people would, you know, at least you'd be friendly, but then stab you in the back when you walk away. But, um, you know, the fact that he could befriend even someone like Peter Manso, who is a self-proclaimed, you know, lefty, you know, he grew up, a pre he grew up in the same housing project as my dad and my uncle, where the Rosenbergs were, but yet he grows up to become friends with Cohn and feels okay with that and finds him fascinating. Um, you know, uh, you know, I think, you know, Cohn had the ability to walk among so many people. Um, and there's, you know, stories of him showing up at the democratic convention in 1968 and being, you know, welcomed, you know, people like Sidney Zion was trailing him thinking, you know, he's going to, he's going to be treated, you know, like the, like, you know, crap walking into this you know into the convention but yet there are numerous democrats hugging him and welcoming him as one of their own so that happened a lot and i i don't think i think trump has been so divisive and so you know just you know trashing people so readily that it doesn't you know it doesn't work as well for him it seems as it, as it did for Cohn. michael do you have anything to add nope no that was perfect <laughs> <laughs> thanks dad <laughs> <laughs> we have a question here from um, Nancy Snyder, who I know lives in um, San Francisco. Um, she's a, a big um, supporter of the Right Connection. Um, was Cohn ever socially ostracized at Provincetown, New York City for his anti-communism um, work? Did anyone publicly turn their back on Cohn when he entered a restaurant? 
So you 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 can answer that question. Oh yeah, yes. I mean, I I think so. Yeah. I mean, people people absolutely. I heard lots of stories of both in New York and on the Cape, uh, where you know people were absolutely horrified to see him. And if you've um, if you haven't seen the film. There's a there's a great story in there that John the filmmaker John Waters tells about you know how disgusted he personally was to see uh, to see Cone in Provincetown, and he talks about that Cone would go to Front Street, which was the, the popular the hot spot, and um, and that the owner of the restaurant would allow him to come in. I won't give away the great line actually. Yeah, don't. <laughs> uh, I don't. won't give away the watch great the line, movie. but <laughs> watch the film, which is on HBO streaming on HBO. I saw someone ask a question where they can see the film. Um, and if you don't have HBO, I think you can do the 14 day free trial and, and get to see it that way if you don't wanna sign up for HBO. So don't tell HBO I said that. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I, I heard lots of stories, you know, people confronting him. Um, uh, there was even a story of a, a, you know, him in a restaurant. God, I'm gonna forget the name of it, but it was a well-known gay uh, establishment. Um, where Cohn was was eating lunch and the activist Ethan Ghetto, who's in my film also, who's a gay rights activist, was with a friend there and they saw Cohn eating there and they couldn't, they just couldn't take it. So they approached him and they said, they said, oh, looks like you're, you know, having a good time here at the, you know, and 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 accused him, you know, say, oh, you you you'll attack gays publicly, but you'll you'll sit here and eat at the restaurant. And he's, I don't know what you're talking about. This isn't a gay restaurant. And he fumed and, you know, got really angry. Lo and behold, it turned out that he was actually a partner in that restaurant. <laughs> Not only was he eating there, but he had invested in it secretly. So, I mean, this is the kind of stuff he did all the time. But yes, to answer the uh, Nancy's question, I think people, I think in Provincetown in particular, he, he was met with a lot of resistance. And you also hear in the film that, you know, people who rent, like uh, Ann Packard, the artist who rented to him, had many neighbors saying to her, how could you, how could you bring him, among, you know, to live among us? And yeah, he was not, not well loved there. So, um, which brings us to the title of the film, Bully, Coward, Victim. And can you tell us about how you came upon that title? I mean, I think a lot of us understand bully and coward, but the victim part. Uh, well, I mean, uh, as is revealed in the film, I, I borrowed the title from the AIDS quilt. Um, the, there was a, it was called the Names Project um, in the late, what oh God, was it 90? 80s. In late 80s, yeah. Um, there is an incredible art exhibit. You can look up, I, I urge anyone to look up the history of this um, to commemorate uh, lives lost from the AIDS um, where there were individual quilts made to commemorate, and it was just, it was rolled out on the mall and at the Smithsonian in Washington, massive display. And my dad and I went there and the first panel we saw that we stumbled upon, which could have out of thousands and tens of thousands was Roy Cohn, which someone had decided to make a, a panel devoted to him to make sure that people remembered that he was this hypocrite who died of AIDS. And it was, it said bully coward victim, Roy Cohn and then yarn and it was, and it just struck me. And so when we were coming up with the title, I felt that yes, bully and coward, clearly we can, I mean, coward, most bullies are cowards, right? You could, you know, that's, that's a prob pretty obvious thing. And he was a coward for a lot, you know, many reasons, but one in particular being that he was a coward to not, especially when he knew he had AIDS to be, be the voice who could actually had the ear of the Reagan administration who famously ignored the crisis, diminished and, and many, many people died. Sound familiar, right? Um, and he, you know, so that was cowardly, of course. The victim part is to me, you know, he was a gay man who had to hide who he, who he was. Um, who he truly was. And so I, to me, it's kind of this, anyone, no matter how, um, how much I might despise them can still, they're not mutually exclusive to be, they, he could be a victim of societal bigotry. And it's important for us all to recognize that, that how it helped shape him and turn him into this monster. He didn't have to become that, but it certainly influenced that. And um, I think, you know, we can, we can still not forgive him and recognize that he was also a victim. I was, um, had read an article by Nicholas von Hoffman in um, Life Magazine 
where he, you know, talks about um, Cohen's um, final days and a lot of references to Provincetown. And he talks about how um, they were, he was very close friends with the Reagans. And when he was laid out in his casket, he had a Reagan tie on. Um. <laughs> I forgot that detail. Wow. Yeah. Gosh. Jeez. Um, so that, you know, yeah. tells you something. And then um, Susan Baker had written a book um, about, prop, you know, the history of Provincetown and it's um, paint, you know, uh, satirical paintings, I guess you could say. And one of them is a picture of Roy Cohn in his underwear on top of a piano. Yeah. Singing God Bless America. And apparently, um, well, you had inter interviewed Bob B. Weatherby about that. That's you right. Yeah, Bobby, um, that actually, um, that, that painting, which was on the cover of Provincetown Magazine, not to be confused with Provincetown Arts, um, uh, is part of, is what led us to start to, to find Bobby. Um, so Bobby Weatherby is a performer, pianist, wonderful artist um, who's been performing at the Crown and Anchor since Cone was a regular. And, and so he could speak to you know, that story. And actually we had interviewed him and I wanted, I wanted to include the fact that Cone Bobby would close all his shows with, with, um, and have everybody in the room sing God Bless America. So he always had, he had memories of Cone standing up and singing God Bless America very loudly. <laughs> but do you think that he was really a patriot or do you think that was sort of like flag waving, false patriotism? Well, I mean, that's, that depends on how, what your definition of patriot is. Um, and, you know, to me, no, um, I think he believed he was a true patriot and that he was defending the, you know, I do believe, I do think he truly believed. I wondered this myself, Margaret, when I first started making the film, like, was this mostly an act? Many of the, like, his anti-communist activities, his, an, you know, his so-called, you know, patriotism and his, um, you know, I, I I wondered if it was just a way to stir up fear and you know manipulate the public and stay in power. But I actually think that that he he believed he he was a true patriot. But to me, people who quash the you know right to protest and people who um, you know are, are firmly against the progress and including you know rights um, expanding rights for all people. Uh, that's not being a true patriot. So what do you have to say? I think <laughs> there's an interesting contrast between McCarthy, who was a pure charlatan, who seized on anti-communism as a way to make a name for himself, and Cohn, who, you know, the impression I get is that he was this deep-seated anti-communist in his bones, and he never, he never changed. Uh, he right. never flip-flopped. Um, you know, Trump is a perfect example of somebody with no uh, core at all, no beliefs at all. I mean, so Trump would be the exact opposite of Cohn in terms of patriotism, self-described patriotism. But I, of course, obviously agree with you, Ivy. You can't be an American patriot and ride roughshod over the Bill of Rights and right. throw it into a shredder. Right. And Cohn, you know, Cohn was an intellectual. I mean, you know, whether you agree or disagree with him, I mean, the fact that, I mean, he was, you know, his anti-communism was rooted in, you know, a lot of reading and a lot of experience. And, you know, we say in, in the film, his old friend Taki Theocopolis, who's quite a character, um, who's a Greek shipping magnet, you know, he says it best. He says, oh, we hated communism because it, it threatened our way of life. That's very telling. It threatened their way of life. You know, yeah, they're the capitalist, you know, like power brokers who are, you know, um, doing really well on the backs of everybody else. So of course it threatens their way of life, but it was a very honest thing that he said. And I think that that, you know, that Cone was a true believer. So this question is for Michael. Um, and it's from Bar Barbara Dean again. And she wants to know how you feel about Meryl Streep's performance as Ethel in Angels <laughs> of America. I thought she did a pretty damn good job. Um, I've watched many different versions of Angels. And uh, I think she did very a really good job. Um, I'm kind of partial to the revival, the woman who played Ethel in the 
revival that Ivy and Thomas and I got to see when Ivy got some of the film where, where Nathan R Lane starred. Um, uh, but I think- Susan, uh, I think her name is Susan Brown. Was uh -huh. yeah. well, very impressive that, uh, except for Nathan Lane, I think everybody else in the, uh, in the revival was from the British Isles. And they put on these accents beautifully absolutely beautifully <laughs> and uh i think i think that was my favorite version of ethel rosenberg but meryl streep did a good job she did a good job <laughs> so two people have raised their hands and i have to tell you that i'm not that good at zoom webinars so <laughs> you can text your question in that would be helpful and and hopefully we'll get to it so um nancy um <clears throat> snyder has a quote from thoreau's journal um, 1851, there's a reptile in the throat of the greedy man, always thirsting and famishing. Is it not his own natural hunger and thirst, which he satisfies? That describes Roy Cohn to Nancy. Wow, that's pretty powerful, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, here's a question from um, Stanford Forrester. Can you address if anti-Semitism played a part? Which would be interesting since Cohn was a Jew, the sentencing yes. judge Irving Kaufman was Jewish, and many of the, uh, the, the atomic spies were um, Jews and uh, first immigration, first <clears throat> generation immigrants from Russia. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure my dad will have something to add to this, but I'll just say absolutely, um, anti-Semitism played a big factor in both my grandparents' case um, and, and who Cohn became. I think I don't think it's just that he was closeted gay man. He also was very uncomfortable with being Jewish, especially during a time, as you say, when many Jews or were directly associated or assumed to be socialist or communist. And of course, that would not be something he would want people to think about him. So there was an active, you know, during my grandparents' trial, um, the idea that you were a good, good, the good Jews versus the bad Jews, right? It was a very stark, you know, they wanted to make that very clear. So they loaded the trial with, I mean, it, not just the judge, but the lead prosecutor, Irving Sapol was Jewish. And then of course, Cohn. And so absolutely, I think that was a very, they it were pointed. And I also think it's it, in a lot of what motivated Cohn to go, be so ruthless and criminal in his pursuit of, um, you know, uh, conviction and then execution of my grandparents, especially my grandmother. He's like, you know, the ends justified the means for him. We can make a big point that, you know, the bad Jews need to be eradicated. This is, you know, that's what he was going to do. Um, and then uh, just as a side note, you know, this didn't go, this doesn't go away. All right. We're obviously still living with a lot of these feelings. But when I first set out to make Air to an Execution in early 2000s, um, HBO was interested early on and the chief executive there, Sheila Nevins, who's head, was head of documentary programming and a force to reckon with, was warned by a big Hollywood producer, you don't want to touch that story. Don't touch, don't touch that story. We don't need to revisit that. That's not, that's not good for the Jews to have uh, the granddaughter of the Rosenbergs making a film about them. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did. Yeah, thank you. Dad, do you want to add to that or is that, do you want to go no, on? No, I think that the, the other part of that is that um, though my parents were arrested because they were communists and because my father, in fact, had been involved in helping the Soviet Union during World War II, during the period when they were fighting for their lives and there was a national movement and an international movement for clemency, that was when the anti-Semites had a field day and they went wild in making sure that the non-Jewish population of the United States realized that these were dangerous foreign Jews. And the fact that they were Jews and communists was very important to the anti-Semites. In other words, anti-Semitism wasn't a cause, but anti-Semitism was given a tremendous boost by the conviction of my parents. Mm -hmm. Well, we have five more minutes for questions and um, I, you know, send them. Um, this is your last chance because Michael doesn't often make appearances in public anymore, right? Sure. 
I hear somebody asked me a question about strange fruit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can see that. That's right. Can you talk about strange fruit and its legacy over the years, especially its renewed and sad re um, renaissance now with uh, George Floyd? And um, I mispronounced that word, of course, but that links into your the people who adopted you in your last yeah. year. Yeah. My father, Abel Mirapo, was most proud of Strange Fruit. He wrote both the words and the music. Unfortunately, Billy Holiday's biographer, uh, ghostwriter, uh, put words in her mouth to the effect that she had actually written the music to my father's poem. Not true. And uh, everybody acknowledges that at this point. And <laughs> Billy Holiday's reaction when somebody talked to her about it was that she had never even read the book that that guy wrote in her name. <laughs> so it's certainly not her fault that uh, he made that claim for her. Um, and that song was just listed as one of Bruce Spring Springsteen's top 10 songs of the century. And he was the, the subject of a big column by David Brooks, which uh, I was very impressed with. The reason, the sad thing, the reason Strange Fruit remains relevant I'm sorry to be so blunt. Black people are still getting lynched. Now, they're not getting lynched by extrajudicial lynch mobs. They're getting lynched by individual cops who get upset and angry and scared, shoot them, and then are able to use the five magic words. I feared for my life. And that's why the grand jury never indicted Eric Garner. And that's why juries uh, found not guilty the murderers of Amadou Diallo or Eric Bell in, Cle in Queens. I mean, until juries start convicting cops of murdering blacks, the lynching will go on, just as it wasn't until law enforcement stopped lynch mobs at the point of a gun in the 1930s that lynching finally died out, although it, it, it never fully died out. We know Emmett Till was lynched in the 1950s. So I, I long for the day, and maybe my grandchildren will see it, when strange fruit will be a relic of a bygone past, of a barbarous past, when it was dangerous to live while black. Thank you very much. Um, I saw, I don't know if I read it in an interview, um, that somebody was asked you, what was it like? I mean, you were taken in, I guess, by friends of your family who- No, 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 no. Huh? Strangers, they knew Manny Block, they didn't know the family. But I mean, were they, no, somebody else. but the people, were you, were you like the darling of the communists in New York City, you and your brother? We were private kids, citizens. We were uh, sheltered from uh, that kind of attention. We were brought up as incredibly normal people. We had very boring, normal, Childhood. Well, no, but I think what Margaret is asking that before before you were adopted and were taken out of public view, and that period of time during during the trial and soon after and after the execution, you were you were you were shuttled around, weren't you? Like you know, you, you met you know you W E B Du Bois, you met you know Arthur Miller, you were brought you know you were you, they were I think Margaret definitely at least briefly. It, it was pretty damn brief. We mostly, <laughs> we mostly were, uh, I, were, were, were sheltered. People did their very best well, to shelter us. I read us. somewhere where you said that when you were in college, um, the, you know, SDS, um, young, it was, um, seemed more pertinent to you than the old, the old, the old left. Yeah. yeah the old left. So I thought maybe you had like somehow knew them. I know that the woods of Truro and Wellfleet were filled with, you know, white Russians and red Russians. <laughs> well, I think, I think what you're talking about is af after my dad and uncle came out as right. the miracle. After 1974. After 1974, certainly uh, many, many people, um, you know, prominent lefties rallied around them. Yeah, no question, no question. So we have, um, I'm going to get back to the audience questions. Um, one is from Ellen Fine, um, totally resonating with the good Jew versus bad Jew narrative from my own family, where some worked hard to not align with communists. Can you talk about the images of Jewish folks then surrounding the trial and Jewish supporters of Trump 
and how that plays into neo-Nazi trope of worldwide Jewish conspiracy stuff. Wow. <laughs> Dad, do you want to take that one? That's a biggie. <laughs> um, go ahead. Well, it, it, today is a really weird time because on some level, the, among the most right-wing religious conservative Christian supporters of Israel is this idea that the only way the Messiah will ever come is if all the Jews show up in Israel and then, um, you know, they're given the choice, you know, uh, convert or get burned. And that's the only way the Messiah will come. That's one of the readings of the book of Revelations. Uh, there are plenty of Christians who think that there's no way for Jesus to come back to earth till we get all the Jews to Israel, leaving out the fact that the whole point of getting the Jews to Israel from that point of view is to give them the final choice of convert or die, which Jewish supporters of Israel would rather not think about. So that's, I mean, it's a weird situation. I mean, the, the extreme pro-Israel right-wing groups like Sheldon Adelson, you know, are, are, are doing things that are just so anathema to Jewish tradition of, 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 of empathy and sympathy and support for the underdog, uh, you know, the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament that says, welcome the stranger, welcome the stranger. And Stephen Miller, who's a Jew who wants to get rid of all the strangers as long as they're not white Norwegians. I mean, it, it, it just disgusts me as, as a Jew. One of the, um, <clears throat> the people in the audience, Barbara Goschel, uh, has a comment. Um, I was born in 1944 in a into a Michigan family, very exposed to newspapers and radio journalism. The Rosenberg execution haunted my childhood, especially my dreams for years. Loss of apparent terror. Later, the McCarthy hearings destroyed the career of my uncle, Mac Fisher, in the State Department. Thank you for this program. I'm finding it personally helpful. Do you find, have others come forward when you, when you come and talk about your family situation um, that they can relate to it? Well, I mean, I met, they can relate beginning, to beginning in 1974, when I and my brother came out in public and we went and gave speeches, many, many places we would run into people who, you know, childhoods were touched by the Red Scare. You know, no question about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and even me, you know, uh, another generation removed, um, I remember vividly an experience when I was working for a Florida congressman um, in a district that's full of New York Jews. <laughs> and so I felt very at home there. Um, I went uh, to accompany him to a speech for a speech that I had written for him. And I was just kind of standing by and I had a name tag on and one elderly woman came up to me and said, are you you know, she knew the name and, and I said, yes. And my boss is about to start speaking and slow, very quickly, this crowd formed around me. People started crying, wanting to, you know, and feel very moved, not just by the history, you know, feeling like they're touching history and remembering where they were when, you know, they heard and that my father was orphaned and my uncle's orphaned and how it a tra tragic story, but also bringing up their own fears of what it felt like, you know, there's a reminder of like what it felt like to be, you know, just Jewish and maybe liberal or maybe, you know, maybe, you know, so, you know, being caught up in, in how dangerous it felt to be, uh, be who they are, um, you know. So that was, yeah, I remember being really struck by that. Brittany um, Glucksman writes, thank you for your discussion. I've been horrified about the Rosenberg's case their children's situation before adoption, the kindness of the Mirapoles, the awful beauty of strange fruit, the books you and your brother have written, this case and American history, haunted is an apt word. Thank you again. Thank you. And then Luella Landis, um, thanks you for presenting this very important conversation. So, Thank you, that's so nice. <laughs> we'll run over. We have one more from um, Tammy Rose. Thank you for this and thank you for your continued eloquence in the face of such pain, a lesson for us all. It is a pleasure and honor to be introduced to you both. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, that's very kind. So we did go over a little bit. Um, if there's the a couple more questions, we can do it, right, Dad? Oh, we're fine. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, this is from Jan Ross. What's next in your wonderful work? <laughs> Well, I am. I mean, one thing I'm trying to do uh, is is help uh, is work on a scripted version of the this film. So a cone, a, a film about Roy Cohn, not a film, sorry, a scripted like limited series type, you know, period piece. Uh, because I have so there are so many stories that I could not include in the in the documentary, and I just think he's a. Uh, it, it's a it's an important story to tell in another in another way and maybe get a, even a larger audience people who don't watch documentaries so that's one project I'm working on I'm actually also working on a film set on the Cape Margaret you'll be interested in because <laughs> um, I can never get enough of being there of course and um, uh, as many of you might know there's this so-called great white shark problem happening there mm -hmm. and I started becoming very interested in what I typically do is not so much, as much about the sharks themselves, but about the people and what and the 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 fights that are going on now um, about what to do about this. And Jaws. so, it, yes, it's and yes, and then I've proposed to shoot it as an homage to Jaws. So I have a, I have a lot of interest because I want stylistically I want to shoot as an homage to Jaws, but this because the story is so similar, but also so relevant today. I mean, and then a lot and and oddly, you know, I mean, there's some for instance the group that's really pushing to there's a group um that of real really trump supporters who are pushing to cull seals and open up hunting for on sharks and they are trying to get to trump to do this and i just find it fascinating you know what what what's gonna what what we're gonna do about this because the seal population is exploding and that's gonna be a big problem so it's a story but it's also really a portrait of provincetown and the outer cape and the wonderful characters there. Um, and just the idea of like, what, what do we do when nature, you know, doesn't obey how we, how we want it to? And how do we, and how do we as a people try to live more harmoniously with nature instead of trying to control it? Um, which of course has some relevance today too. So that's, that's something I'm working on right now. I want to be cast in a beach scene. Like, as <laughs> yes, <a> yes. <laughs> sure. Uh I promise I'll be reading your dad's book, you know, when you, when you do like a pan. <laughs> oh, that would be great. <laughs> um, this is from, awesome. let's see, um, Barbara Dean, thank you both so much for this wonderful program. It is my honor to be friends with Robbie and um, my eyesight's bad, Ellie, and an honor to meet Michael and Anne during our celebration of the 150th birthday of W.E. Dubois in his hometown of Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Oh, that was a wonderful event. And from Ellen Fine, you both seem so focused and mentally healthy and happy. Please <laughs> talk about what, what you see in your upbringing that brought you there considering the trauma surrounding your family. And I wanted to ask that same question, um, but I also want to add, um, were you surrounded by folk singers all the time? <laughs> Are you talking about Ivy was? I was, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, maybe that I wonder, like, if Michael knew, like, Pete Seeger and oh yeah, and and yeah. Pete Seeger Robert. was a friend of Abel and Ann's. Yeah. I didn't get to meet him till I was seventeen, but I, the minute I walked into their house, there were Pete Seeger records and Paul Robeson records, and my mother was a guitar player, so I, at the age of twelve, I started to play the guitar, and uh, I actually, uh, at one point, I was, uh, you know interested in maybe you know i made some money in britain when i was in graduate school in britain <laughs> sing, singing in pubs and uh two friends and i street sang in copenhagen and norway and sweden but uh starting in 1966 i was a graduate student and everybody in the united states was interested in the electric guitar at that point so starting in 1966 i was a guitarist for family and that's why ivy grew up listening to guitar playing just nice. you know, from the time she was yes. one, for God's sake. There's a lot of there's a lot of singing in circles in our house, um, <laughs> in our family. Um, and my dad neglected to say that he actually cut an album once when he was at Swarthmore called mm -hmm. "Between Lunch." What, what was it called? Between, Between lunch and the library. <laughs> Between <laughs> lunch and the library. Oh God. Well, um, but to, sorry to answer that question. Yeah, the upbringing question. I mean, Dad, you can speak to this more, but I can just say from what 
I, I mean, I one I asked my father that before too. And when I was making Aired and Execution, certainly I had pr um, producers at HBO, especially when I was showing them footage saying like, how is it your father is not an ax murderer? I mean, that's the kind of questions I would get. And I still get that. Um, that's an extreme version of this question, but the, you know, the short answer that my dad would always give me, and you can add to it, dad, is that you had two sets of wonderful parents and, yeah. that, and that, and that I would add to that. He also had com a community that circled around them even before they were adopted by the mirror, even before they were adopted by the mirror poles, and then after that protected them and supported them and nurtured them. And it's a testament to, how people can overcome like immense pain and tragedy if, if, if people rally around them, if a community comes together, children yeah. can be saved, anyone can be saved. Absolutely. And um, Jan Ross writes, brilliant and timely, we live in the virus's world. Mm. I don't know if you- And the virus is not just COVID, it's Trump. <laughs> going to ask you to make, a, <laughs> you make a link to that um and tammy wants to be an extra tammy rose wants to be an extra in the movie too oh good <laughs> stage management she used to be a stage manager in off broadway when she oh. was a younger person so she might be able to help in that regard yeah well certainly since i'm i mean that's an ambitious plan to try to shoot it as an homage to jaws it's not typical documentary so maybe i'll need help <laughs> um Somebody, Marjorie Merritt, um, who's out in Oregon, writes, virus is Trump. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank you both for your time. We went over about, um, I'm thrilled. I, I've seen Bully Coward Victim. It's, it's a very moving film, as was heir to an execution. And um, I'm delighted to see you again after so many years and to uh, finally meet you, Michael. And, Thank you so Pleasure. much. Yeah, thank you, Margaret, for, thank you so much, Margaret, for organizing this and having yes. us. Yes, I thank you so much. It was, it's a really good opportunity. And anybody who hasn't seen Bully Coward Victim, get on HBO Max and watch it. It's worth it. It is. All right, well, bye. <laughs> thank you all. And thanks everybody for coming on. <laughs> and hooray for Henry David Thoreau. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Bye now.